I'm going to introduce from Google Aparna Sinha, um, who is the project lead for Kubernetes. We're really lucky to have her here today. She's going to give a, a version of the, what's going to be the keynote at KubeCon now, um, and a short synopsis of that for you, and a couple of demos. So we're going to go right into it, and thank you, and take it away. Great, thank you, Diane. I feel very fortunate. I've got slides, I think, or head slides. There we go. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Aparna Sinha. Uh, I'm a product manager at Google uh, for the Kubernetes project. And uh, today, um, I want to, um, first of all, welcome all of you, and I am really delighted to talk here. Uh, a little bit about uh, Google and uh, Red Hat's contributions, uh, as well as hopefully demo uh, two of the new features that are in this release. I'm, I was hoping to do a live demo, uh, but we will probably have to look at a recorded version. So I think with uh, this audience, I don't really have to introduce Kubernetes. I think you all know that um, this is a project that started uh, from the Borg heritage uh, of Google uh, but really, even though it is based on um, you know, years of experience at Google uh, running applications and distributed systems, the goal of this project is not about Google. Uh, the goal of this project is to create a platform for the rest of the world to be able to run applications on distributed systems at high efficiency uh, and high utilization. And this, is a, this platform goal is not something that Google can achieve by itself. And that's one of the primary reasons why, from the start, Kubernetes was started as an open source project on GitHub and then donated to the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. There is a community uh, that uh, we have worked hard to develop and foster around this project that um, works on and basically shares this goal with us, which is to create this common platform. And this chart shows the evolution of that community. So you can see, whereas in the beginning, Google and Red Hat were, in fact, quite um, prominent in terms of the contributions and the commits that were made to the project, over time, the number of independents uh, independent contributors that aren't necessarily associated with any company has grown, as well as the number of companies that are part of the community has grown. Um, and this diversity of uh, companies is, and individuals is extremely important to that platform goal. If you're trying to have a project that is the platform for the rest of the world, then you need the diversity of the different different environments that other users work in. And throughout all of this, Google and Red Hat have both learned from the community, but also continue to play a formative role in the Kubernetes project. A few of the statistics um, that you know, point towards uh, or indicate that uh, we are actually achieving some level of success towards that platform goal. First of all, uh, you can see you know, there's a lot of user and customer interest in Kubernetes. Uh, and also, uh, there's a lot of interest uh, from contributors. You can sort of see here, you know, on Google Trends over the last uh, two years, a huge increase in uh, the Kubernetes interest, but also 30 plus commercial distributions uh, of Kubernetes to date. These are essentially companies that have taken Kubernetes and adapted it to different environments. And that ranges every, everywhere from bare metal to VMware. I think we have Wendy from VMware here in the audience. Uh, we have Quintin from Huawei. So it ranges everywhere, everywhere from bare metal to VMware to, of course, public and private clouds, and ranges from China uh, with Huawei to IBM. With this variety, I think Kubernetes has a shot at achieving that goal. I'd just like to give you a flavor of uh, the contributions and the level of depth uh, that uh, Red Hat and OpenShift has had in shaping the Kubernetes project. So this slide shows um, a current snapshot of all the special interest groups in the project. Uh, this is always changing. We are adding and collapsing groups. Um, but uh, 
The next slide actually shows how many of these special interest groups are led by a, a, an engineer from, uh, from Red Hat. Uh, next slide, please. Each group has multiple leaders, but as you can see, a lot, this is I think about 40%, uh, the ones that are red, have a Red Hat uh, engineer leading that group. Leading the group means that you are helping to shape this specific area. So you're helping to shape storage and scheduling and network and how those things work in Kubernetes. Hopefully, uh, to those of you in the audience that are OpenShift users, uh, this gives you a lot of comfort. Uh, your needs and your requirements have a tremendous hand in shaping the direction of the Kubernetes project. And really, this is no different in the 1.6 release, which is launching this week. Next slide, please. So the Kubernetes 1.6 release, uh, the, the major theme of this release is multi-workload, multi-team, large clusters. There are many features in this release. Large clusters is, of course, one of the features. But I want to emphasize two particular standout features. Uh, and that is role-based access control and storage classes, also known as dynamic storage provisioning. These two features uh, are important because they add critical functionality that I think changes the game of what you can do with containers in production. They're also important because Google and Red Hat have had uh, a large hand in driving these two features to stability. So our back is all about fine-grained access control, and it is moving to beta in this release. It moves us fundamentally from a single user to a multi-user cluster. It's a huge step forward for the product. Storage classes uh, and, the, and the defaults that are associated with them support stateful containerized applications. And as you know, that is also a, a huge step forward because it expands the market for what containers can do. For many, many months uh, previously, stateful applications were not considered appropriate to put into containers. And what dynamic storage provisioning does in terms of automating storage is really fundamental for stateful support. So those are the two that I'm going to hopefully demo today. Uh, and of course, cool new features are nice, but uh, I think many of you here are users of OpenShift and many, hopefully, enterprise users as well. How many of you care about stability? Yeah, that's everybody. <laughs> so 1.6 uh, was a release where the entire community banded together and emphasized finishing features. Not launching new features, but finishing them, moving them from alpha to beta to stable and over 20 features were graduated to either beta or stable. Next slide. Now I'm gonna go into the features. So the first one is uh, role-based access control, which is really, now that you have you know, a large cluster or multiple large clusters, how do you schedule multiple teams into those clusters such that they don't interfere with each other and they have the right set of permissions? Next slide, yes. Um, this. Uh, this change, uh, you know, one of our uh, founders and, and, and lead TLs, Tim Hawken, characterizes the introduction of, uh, of RBAC beta as it's like we went from DOS, which was, uh, you know, single user, uh, where everyone uh, can see everything, to Unix, where, uh, you know, you see only your things and uh, there's the principle of least privilege. So it, it's that type of big change for us. Next slide. This is what we look like before fine-grained RBAC. You know, you have here a, th a three-node or 5,000-node cluster. You have multiple pods, um, multiple workloads, in fact, uh, that belong to different teams. But there isn't a good way uh, through the Kubernetes API to set up authorization. And so, um, you know, authorization is... Uh, by default at the cluster level, and all pods have the same authorization. It's kind of vanilla. It looks the same. Uh, we did have a mechanism called ABAC, um, but that is more based on a static local file 
whereas our back is truly dynamic uh, and is through the Kubernetes API. So next slide. With role-based access control, the picture looks something like this. You can isolate into namespaces. Here we are showing the workloads of the blue team in a blue namespace and the workloads of the green team in a green namespace. And what's more important is that on a per namespace, per resource basis, you can set which roles have what actions over what resources and what namespaces. This is actually very powerful. There are many, many use cases for this. Here's just a couple examples. Uh, we have Alice, she is a user. Her role is user and uh, she can list, which is like view permissions, uh, eng services, service is a type of resource, uh, and eng and hr are namespaces here. So she can view services in the eng namespace but not in the hr namespace. You see the level of granularity. It's at the per resource, per um, namespace level for each role and each user. That's nice. And, and of course, with this level of granularity, there's a huge world of permutations that are enabled. So we see some other examples. Bob, uh, you know, Bob has more um, uh, admin type rights, so he's not just viewing, he's creating. He can create pods in one namespace, not the other. The scheduler, the third example, is actually a system role. It's not a person, it's a system role, and this role can read pods, but not another resource, which is secrets. So now, let's get into the demo. Hopefully, uh, you can play the video, and uh, I'm not sure if it's gonna be as large as I would have liked, but hopefully you can see something. So in order to do this demo, uh, I have created a three-node cluster in uh, Google Container Engine in Google Cloud, and uh, yes, uh, can you see the screen? Okay, good. <laughs> People in the back may be hard, but... Uh, okay, so now this is proceeding. Um, in order to show this demo, you actually need three users, or you need more than one user. So I'm going to pretend here to be multiple users. In this first tab, I am kind of the super cluster admin. And the other two tabs are actually, I'm going to be a green team and a blue team. The first thing that I'm doing here is, as a super cluster admin, I'm going to create a service account for the blue team and fetch those credentials into a local file, and the same thing for the green team. Now I'm going to the blue team tab, and I'm going to uh, configure kubectl to use the credentials that I just created for the blue team. This is all set up, so basically I'm setting up the blue team in the blue tab, and then uh, I'm gonna do the same thing for the green team. So the green team is also going to go ahead and get credentials, um, and actually, the, could you pause the demo for a second? I think we have moved, uh, we've moved ahead. So, yes, here. Uh, let me create a namespace for the blue team. I've gone ahead and created, as a cluster admin, a namespace for the blue team. Um, but if I go to the blue team at this point, I haven't given them access, which is why you saw the error where the blue team wasn't actually able to access the namespace. So now I'm going to give the blue team access to the namespace. This is actually showing you RBAC. So one of the defining things in RBAC is this concept of cluster roles. And these are uh, some of the default user roles, admin, edit, view. There's also system roles, which I'm not showing. I've you know, hidden the system roles. Let's look at what uh, the cluster role uh, admin can do. And there are many things here. This is just looking at a subset of them. But they have a, a cluster uh, role admin has granular, uh, uh, granular permissions over resources, many resources and sub-resources, and these verbs, create, delete, list, watch, these are some of the things that the admin can do, okay? So now that we know what this role is, what we want to do is to create a role binding. We want to create a role binding to the blue namespace for the blue developer, the blue service account. So hopefully this will move forward. Uh, yes, and this is what a, uh, uh, a role binding looks like. So this is a role binding, and what this role binding says is, uh, for the blue namespace, I would like the user, blue team developer, which is a service account for this example, I would like that user to have admin role for that namespace. So that means everything you saw above, the blue developer can do, create, delete, watch, etc for the resources in the blue namespace only. 
Now we're going to create this role binding object. It's been created. Let's go to the blue service account, the blue team, and see. Previously, he, didn't, he wasn't able to access the namespace. Now he is. kubectl get pods for the blue namespace, and we don't get the error. Of course, there are no resources yet, so let's go ahead and create some resources in the blue namespace. We're going to create an Nginx deployment. Nginx deployment, now let's see if that's been created. Get pods. Yes, it's running. So the blue developer has access and has uh, execution permissions in, in this namespace. Okay? Uh, there are no services, but this is all working as intended. Let's now do the same thing for the green user. We're going to create a green namespace. And we are going to uh, create a role binding for the green user, exactly as we did. Now, this is for the green namespace. The green team developer is going to have admin permissions, just like the blue one did, except only in the green namespace. OK. So we'll go ahead and create. the green binding. And let's see, I think, let's go and see if the green user, yes, and e the green user is able to get pods. There's no pods. Let's create an uh, Nginx deployment here. Actually, I think we're going to check that he can't have access to the blue namespace. That's right. So you see that the green user has access to the green namespace, but not to the blue namespace. This is what we want, right? So this is great. Let's uh, run this forward and, uh, of course, uh, create an Nginx deployment, see services. There's no services. So this is working as intended. The last thing that I want to show you is uh, cross namespace permissions. So we're going to now, let's say that green user uh, wants to be able to monitor uh, the blue namespace, all the resources in the blue namespace, but not uh, to change them. Actually, going back to the blue namespace, I'm just showing that the blue user uh, does not have any permissions in the green namespace. So cannot get pods, cannot get services. The blue user should not. We did not set that up, right? This is working. But we want to give the green user read access to the blue namespace. Read, not write. And so I'm going to show how to do that. Of course, the blue user cannot do that. The green user cannot do that. Only the admin, the super user here, can do that because that person can see all the namespaces. So you can see as the admin, hopefully you can see this, uh, admin can see the blue Nginx and the green Nginx deployment, as well as a bunch of system deployments that are on. Now I'm going to create a, a role binding for uh, the green user to have view permissions in the blue namespace. So here you see this role binding, namespace blue. I want view permissions for the green team developer to the blue namespace. And of course, as you, you know, there are many permutations you can do. This is just what we want to demo here. Let's create this binding. And we'll go back to the green namespace. And we will show. Let's see what we can do. And yes. So now the green user can get deployments in the blue namespace. So you can see, she, she or he can see those. Let's try to delete this. Let's try and delete something in the blue namespace. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Uh, uh, namespace blue delete deployments, and as expected, don't have write permissions, cannot delete anything. So this is great. This is exactly what we wanted to show, and that concludes the RBAC demo. If we can switch back to my slides, please. Thank you. I'm not sure if I'm running over time. Please let me know, Diane. <laughs> All right, great. So that is role-based access control, uh, I think, for uh, enterprise deployments uh, where you want to have multiple teams, multiple workloads. This should prove very valuable. It is not yet on by default. It, um, it, is, it is available, though, as beta, and in future releases it will go uh, and, and be uh, default. Next slide. So that was the demo. Next slide. Okay, the other feature I said I would talk about is uh, dynamic storage provisioning, which enables and is the backing for stateful workloads. Um, let's see, I think I will present a couple of slides and then move to the demo for this as well. Just quickly, I want to explain what is happening with dynamic storage provisioning. So in dynamic storage provisioning, the idea is, um, actually even in non-dynamic, in static storage provisioning, the idea is that there is a cluster admin 
who creates Kubernetes view of storage. So Kubernetes view of storage is through pers the persistent volume object, which says, okay, I have a storage of X type in, in Y cloud and so many gigs. Uh, and this is what uh, Kubernetes should do with it after you know, my uh, claim to the storage is gone, like either recycle it or keep it around. Uh, and then the user, we have kind of, we want to isolate the pod from, uh, you know, uh, from the actual details of the storage so that the pod is not specific uh, and is actually portable across deployments. Uh, and so we have created this concept of a persistent volume claim. The claim is a request. It's a request for resources that says I want X amount of storage of a particular type in, in case that uh, storage class types are defined. Uh, and so the PVC, the persistent volume claim, when it gets created, it binds to any available persistent volume that meets, it, meets its requests. It's a claim out there saying, I need five gigs. If there's any volume out there that has five gigs that's available, I want to bind to that. And that, once that binding takes place, it's, it's consistent. It stays there. Uh, a pod can uh, associate with the claim, but the, the pod is ephemeral. It uh, goes away or it moves between nodes. The persistent volume claim stays bound to the volume and keeps the data for that pod in that volume uh, so that when the pod comes back, it again uh, associates with the, with the claim and it has access to the same volume. This is extremely important for stateful applications. So that's the, the main mechanism. You can go through the next couple of slides. I just show here's a pod. The pod is associated uh, with the claim, and you can delete the pod, and you can bring the, uh, the pod back, and everything is, is there as, as before. What dynamic storage provisioning does is the changes. In the previous slide, what we were looking at is the storage exists. It's out there. The claim comes along, and it binds to whatever's, whatever's available. Okay? This is wasteful, because someone has to provision that storage in advance, and the storage has to sit there. Right? That's not what we want uh, if we want efficiency. Uh, dynamic storage uh, enables uh, the concept of you know, abstract storage classes. So the cluster admin can still say, yes, I have a storage class you know, that is uh, a, a, an SSD or a standard disk or whatever. Uh, but it, don't, it doesn't actually need to be provisioned until the pod and the pod claim, uh, the persistent volume claim, is created. So that's the, that's the uh, essential uh, gist of dynamic storage provisioning. And if we have time, we can do the demo. Okay, so this is the demo of uh, dynamic storage provisioning. Uh, let's look at, uh, again, this is the three-node cluster in Google Cloud. Uh, so you are seeing the local disk that is attached to each of the nodes. We haven't created any additional disks. First, I'm going to show you the manual method. Uh, so I'm going to create a disk here. I'm asking uh, Google Cloud to create a disk of size 10 gigabytes. And it's a standard disk. I'm going to call it manual disk 1. Okay. Uh, now, see, I see that this manual disk 1 has been created in US Central, one, in US Central A with uh, 10 gigabytes as requested. The old, uh, old, old, old way, which is a bad practice, is to inline this storage in the pod manifest. So hopefully you can see the screen. Uh, here's the pod manifest. I've said the, that the disk that I want to attach uh, and, and mount here is the GCE persistent disk. Its name is manual disk one. Its file system is X4. This is very, very specific, right? This pod manifest cannot go anywhere, and it can only use that disk. So this is bad. What we want the pod manifest to look like is actually very independent from the details of the storage. So here, it's going to call a persistent volume claim. It just has the name of the claim. It doesn't even say what the claim is. doesn't say how much. doesn't say what type of disk. Nothing. And let's look at uh, the claim. So this is now a very portable pod manifest. It can come and go from cloud to cloud. It can come and go from time to time. Uh, hopefully, I will show you the manifest for the PVC. Uh, yes, so here's the PVC manifest. Uh, and this manifest is also fairly generic. It just says that I want five gigs of storage. And it, does, uh, it, it can declare a storage class. I'm going to come back to explain storage classes. It's a concept in dynamic storage provisioning. But uh, here, we've given the empty string, which means that I don't want to use a storage class. I don't want any storage class. Just give me any five gigs that's available. That's what the, uh, the claim is saying. OK, uh, I think we're going to create this claim. Sorry, I should probably have recorded it faster. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, oh, okay, yes, and I want to show you the persistent volume itself, so I've, I have to create the claim, right? But now I also need to create the volume because this is manual provisioning, and the, the persistent volume manifest is where all of the details are. There I say that it's a five gig storage, it is actually a GCE persistent disk, here's the name, and the reclaim policy. So uh, this is Kubernetes' view of that 10 gig disk. I'm saying, Kubernetes, you can use five gigs of that 10, uh, 10 gig disk, and please delete it after you're done. You could also set this to reclaim, uh, this reclaim policy to uh, you know, recycle it or retain the disk. But I'm gonna delete it uh, for easy cleanup. So this is manual provisioning. Uh, I, have, uh, I have previously provisioned the disk, then I've told uh, Kubernetes about the persistent volume, then I've created the claim. It's a, it's a portable pod, that's nice, but it's still very manual. Okay, now I've gone ahead and created the persistent volume. So the volume is created. You can see that it's, it's created and it's available. Status is available. Now I'm going to create the PVC, the claim, and I'm going to bind it, uh, or Kubernetes is automatically going to bind it, right? So now the PVC came along uh, and it said, I want five gigs. Oh, happens to be a volume already. Uh, you know, five gig volume, let me bind. So now the status of the persistent volume has changed from available to bound. And that completes the manual storage provisioning. What I want to show you is how easy it is to do dynamic storage provisioning. So I think the next step is I'm going to clean this up. Um, yep, delete uh, the, the manual PVC, and that should, delete, uh, that should delete everything. And I'm going to show you that it's deleted. Yep, it should delete the PVC and the PV, and also delete the disk. So now there is no disk. With dynamic storage provisioning, like I said, I don't have to pre-provision the storage. All I need to do, um, well, is create the, is, is create the PVC, the, the claim. But let me first tell you uh, the concept of storage classes. So the storage admin can still come in and declare that there are multiple types of storage available without provisioning them. Here, uh, the admin has created a fast storage class, which is an SSD, and um, when we do get storage classes, we see that the fast class is available as well as the default storage class in 1.6 for Google Cloud is a standard disk. So those two storage classes are available, but no storage has been created. Admin has said what type of storage is available, but nothing has been created. Now the persistent volume claim comes along and it says, yeah, I want to use that fast class, whatever it is that my admin said. I want 10 gigs of it. And when I create uh, this claim, you will see that everything happens automatically. So I don't need to create a persistent volume. I don't need to provision the storage uh, by itself. Uh, you know, the PV has been created. You see this PV with this long uh, numerical number, and it has the right uh, delete policy, and then it's been bound to the PVC. And if we look at the disks, and we get disks, you'll see that the storage has also been provisioned. So this is automation. Nice. No wastage. And then I think I go on and I show you, you know, the default and how to do default. But uh, I, I think for the sake of time, we can skip that. So this is showing dynamic storage provisioning and, and, and the automation enabled there. Again, uh, there's a separation of roles, and if the admin wants, they can set policies around the storage classes, but there's no waste associated with things. We can go back to the slides, please. So in 1.6, in this release that's coming out this week, dynamic storage provisioning has moved to stable. So it is ready, fully ready, for consumption in enterprises. Sorry, previous slide. Uh, yes, uh, and there are a number of sensible defaults uh, that have been uh, set uh, for the different cloud providers. These are some of them. So we saw in Google Cloud, it's a GCEPD. In Amazon, it's a EBS volume and so forth for OpenStack and others. Uh, there are also a number of other storage features. This has been a big release for uh, you know, moving, the storage, uh, moving storage forward. Uh, so there's support for user-written and user-run dynamic PV provisioners, which is very nice, as well as a number of um, third-party plugins that, uh, that have um, made it into the release. That's it for storage. Just have one more slide on the kind of the future of the project and, and where we are going. Uh, so I think, uh, again, we want to be the platform. We're trying to build a platform for the rest of the world to run distributed system applications. Um, and that requires, you know, multi-workload, multi-team, efficient scheduling in, in a cluster, in large clusters or multiple clusters. 
Uh, some of the roadmap here, uh, you know, around security, we're going to make our, ba our back default. Uh, there's also network policy, which allows pods to say, okay, I have access to this network or this part of the network, but not, uh, you know, not, not be available uh, to, to take requests from any part of the network. So that network, that's network policy. Um, we will continue uh, adding more features to stateful application support, uh, upgrading stateful applications uh, without downtime. That's uh, on, the, on the roadmap. Uh, also, GPU support is extremely important uh, for those of you running uh, machine learning, and there are quite a few running machine learning, including TensorFlow and other types of frameworks. So that's coming soon. In fact, there is an alpha implementation uh, of uh, multiple GPUs uh, in, in the 1.6 release. Um, and then uh, I mentioned multi-workload scheduling. So there's several features in this release uh, for uh, you know, custom scheduling uh, and advanced scheduling, uh, but we will continue to forward, move forward on that work to make it efficient to schedule multiple different types of workloads in a cluster. In terms of extensibility, uh, there's work, uh, that's alpha work in this release on different cloud providers, separating those out uh, and uh, making each of those uh, more powerful. Uh, and also the container runtime interface. The CRI for Docker is beta in this release and going forward, we will be adding support for many other runtimes. It just provides flexibility uh, to our users. And then lastly, uh, service catalog. Service catalog, um, SIG service catalog, and, uh, and, the, and the work that they're doing there uh, enables Kubernetes to consume services outside of Kubernetes through a, through a service catalog. Um, and uh, it uses the Open Services uh, Broker API, which uh, has a heritage in the Cloud Foundry Foundation. And so that, uh, that was actually, I think, a couple of releases, last, last release that, 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 that was made available, and there's a, a longer roadmap there. So with that, next slide, I just wanted to thank everybody and welcome you to Berlin and encourage you to try out 1.6, which should be coming out later today or Tuesday Pacific time. Thank you. Thank you. That went incredibly smoothly. Thank you.